Hi, I'm a helpful Southern California Honda person. And recently, we've been doing random acts of helpfulness, like getting a service dog for a child in need and buying science materials for a third grade class. And we can help you too with a great deal on an award winning Honda, like the reliable and completely redesigned Accord, the 2018 North American Car of the Year. Click the dealer locator link to find a dealer near you and go to SoCalHondaDealers.com to suggest a random act of helpfulness for someone you know. Log Talk Radio. Hello, folks. How are you doing? It's Danny Tisdale, and you're listening to the Danny Tisdale Show. Uh, and as we do each and every week and each and every day for the most part, we try to give you a great show with uh, uh, some of the great leaders and legends and trailblazers in Harlem. And we're doing the same today, of course. Now, before we get started, we want you to go to our platforms and check out uh, our great content. One of those places you can do that is on twitter.com backslash hwmag. Also on Facebook at facebook.com backslash hwmag. And, of course, the big boy, our website at harlemworldmag.com and also Harlem World Magazine. Dot com where you can check out all the things that's going on in Harlem, around Harlem, uh, wherever you may be. Of course, we've got a nice uh, 20% of our audience is international, and we love that. Uh, but, of course, our hub that's right here in Harlem. And, you know, let's, let's get started because uh, we have another great guest. And we have uh, on the show today Dr. Paul Fakowski. He's known as the godfather of oceanography. Uh, you know, I got to ask him about that and see where that comes from. He was born in Harlem. He was educated uh, in at City College of New York, where he received his B.S.C. and his M.S.C. degrees. He completed his doctoral thesis in bio- biology and biophysics at the University of British Columbia in 1975. After doctoral research at University of Rhode Island, he moved to Brookhaven National Laboratory. Uh, to join his newly formed oceanography department. And in 1998, he moved to Rutgers University. He received a Guggenheim Fellowship in 1992 and was appointed as CISO and Ida Green Distinguished Professor at the University of British Columbia in 1996. He was elected to a number of learned societies, including the American Geophysical Union, the American Academy of the Arts and Sciences, the National... Academy of Sciences. He also received a number of awards, including the A. G. Hutzman Award of Excellence in Marine Sciences. You know what, guys, girls, ladies, and gentlemen who are listening, uh, Dr. Farkowski has done tons of work, and in 2018, this year, he was nominated as recipient of the Tyler Prize of Environmental Achievement for his work on Photoplankton as it relates to climate change impact. He shares the 2018 Tyler Prize with fellow biological oceanographer Dr. James McCarthy of Harvard University. He works at the Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences at Rutgers University, He's doing his influential research on critical role of the Earth's smallest life forms in the evolution of our modern climate. Dr. Fakowski's research lab is one of the top labs worldwide for biological oceanography. And, Doctor, thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure and, to be and here. And I have to. Uh, and it's uh, it's uh, really fantastic to have you uh, on the show for two big reasons on my part, which is, uh, first, uh, one of my uh, uh, subjects that I love, which is climate change, and, of course, you're from Harlem, so uh, it's <laughs> it's heaven on earth for me right now. And, and again, I want to thank you and congratulate you on winning the uh, uh, Tyler Prize, you and uh, – um, the other doctor. And Jim McCarthy. Yeah. Thank yes, you, Jim so McCarthy. Much. Uh, so and I just for wanna... our, our listeners, I, I just want to let our listeners know that you will officially be presented the Tyler Prize uh, in a ceremony at Washington, D.C. on May 3rd, 2018. I'm sorry. Go ahead, right ahead. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, I a few years ago, I uh, was on a French television show, and uh, they came to uh, for one week to film me. 
Wow. And I went back to uh, 3150 Broadway, the Grant Housing Projects, where I grew up for, for 15 years. Um, wow. And it was, uh, it was, you know, it brought me back to where I grew up as a kid. Mm. And I went to PS125, uh, which is on 123rd Street at Morningside Drive. Right. And, right. uh, and then I went to PS, uh, Junior High School 43. Uh, so I, I spent uh, my formative years in schools in Harlem. And I got a great education yeah. from teachers. Yeah, and it and it sounds like it, uh, Doctor. And I, you know, I, I wanted to use kind of the opening question to kind of lay the foundation for the rest of what we'll talk about. And uh, and part of it is what you just mentioned. How does a kid from Harlem become an award-winning biologist? You know, and I kind of laugh and snicker, but. Um, I mean, I know how it happens, but can you tell those listeners, you know, how that happens? Well, I think when you're a kid, you're you have a lot of interests. Some some kids have a lot of interests. And my father used to take me about every second week on a Saturday hmm. to the Museum of Natural History. And then oh, as a kid, okay. I would also go to uh, the George Bruce Library on 125th Street between Broadway and Amsterdam. And I would read, and I would uh, then. I, the funny thing is, it's serendipitous in a way. A couple of graduate students at Columbia who were living in my building were growing tropical fish, and I went when I was around eight years old to their house. And uh. they, gave me a, they gave me a two and a half gallon fish tank and some guppies, and I started <laughs> to really, really become in, interested in growing tropical fish. And mm. I worked after school. Uh, when I was starting at around 12 years old, and I saved the, uh, I made I think a dollar five cents an hour. Maybe it was a dollar five cents an hour. But I used to go. There was a tropical fish store on the north side of the 125th Street, across from the Grand Housing Project. No longer there. But I used to hang out there and save my money up and buy fish and breed fish and mm. and, ha- mm. and then I got a fuse microscope. And I started to look at the fish eggs and the organisms that were living in the fish tanks. Mm. And I started to get really interested in it because it was fun. So to me, you know, the worst thing about studying biology is it can be very boring if you're in class. But if you're right, actually right. learning about life experientially, you're, 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 you're experiencing uh, an, uh, your microscope or something like this, then it's, it's great. So there used right. to be what's called a foldoscope, which was a dollar, one dollar. <laughs> it, it could magnify 140 times. It was wow. invented by a, a, a Stanford um, uh, engineer, um, Manu uh, Prakash. And I would that it's called a foldoscope, an origami foldoscope. microscope. You put it together. You put it together yourself. Wow. And if you, we gave. Every kid in New York City in the third grade, huh. one of those scopes, I think huh. would be transformative. So there's something that Mike Blumenthal might I be able to right. do with his money. <laughs> um, That's right. <laughs> I mean, it's only costing him a few hundred thousand dollars a year. I don't know how many kids we have in third grade, but in New York, but it, it can't be that many. So, yeah, so, and, and I think you're completely right on that. So to uh, figure out, you know, um, what, what's in the water in your, in your pond when it rains? Uh, you, there are many, many things you can do with a, with a microscope. Certainly so. And, yeah. and the other thing so, to think about are within Harlem, I mean, if you're looking around, you see these rocks, for example, in Morningside uh, Park or, or mm-hmm. Central Park, which is in the northern end of Har- southern end of Harlem at 110th right. Street. Um, mm-hmm. So those rocks... Um, those rocks are what's called gneisses. They're metamorphic rocks. So it just tells you something about the history of the, the age of, of, of New York's environment. Our rock mm. record goes back about 400 million years. Um, so uh, to study a little bit of the environment in which you live, it, it can be a lot of fun. Amazing, amazing, amazing. And I, I think you're right on. And, of course, as listeners can tell, there's something ringing in the background here, but that's certainly okay. Let's see if I can take care of that some way. Very embarrassing. 
Um, but, you know, what I wanted to also ask you, and um, hopefully uh, we can uh, have some of our tech folks take care of that in the background there. Um, I'm sorry. Okay, there we go. You know, I wanted to also ask you, Doctor, I, I'm really uh, curious about this. Did you have a, you know, when the clouds open and the sunshine shine in moment when you said, you know what, I'm on the right track here? Um, that came, well, I had a very tough time in, in high school. I went to Brooklyn Tech, which is an all-boys high school, and I didn't take any biology courses. So when I got to City College and I started to uh, get more interested in science again, uh, I was taking chemistry and biology, and there was one one faculty member, a young faculty member in biology at City College, who was an oceanographer who had just been hired. And he, uh, when I was in my third year, he invited me to go to sea. Uh, go to sea meaning spending two or three days out in, on a small boat that we had at City uh, in New York Park. Out on sea. Out on sea. And I, right. I. Right, and I started to really get excited about uh, looking at the phytoplankton. The, my my microscope was, uh, you know, I took a microscope with me, and I sampled the water, and I could easily see uh, these microscopic organisms that are responsible for making the oxygen on the planet and fixing the carbon dioxide so uh, they can convert themselves to another cell, and those cells are eaten by microzooplankton that are eaten by fish that are making the world go around in the ocean. So um, I started to get, delve into that very seriously for my Ph.D. Uh, later on, and uh, uh, I've been working on it more or less ever since. So there was a, one day that the sun shined, and it was when I walked off to a boat for the first time. <laughs> and it was shining on the sea. I love it. Um, yeah. And, <laughs> you know, people go back and forth regarding the issue of, you know, climate change. Uh, but as mm. – yeah, all right, let me edge into this. We all know something is changing, and it's the climate. Is the climate uh, worse or better than we, we think, Doctor? Well, it's actually a little bit um, – I don't want to make a value judgment worse or better, but it's certainly in a trajectory of warming very rapidly compared yeah. to what we know from the geologic past. So uh, there is no question that this is due to the emissions of carbon dioxide from burning of fossil mm -hmm. fuel. And mm -hmm. that began with the beginning of, of the Industrial Revolution in the mm -hmm. early part of the 19th century. In the last century. Um, and uh, was, so it was James Watt who invented a, a, a coal-fired steam engine. And then, of course, electricity mm -hmm. was developed mm -hmm. in New York City. Actually, it was developed in Brooklyn. Um, mm first by uh, Thomas Alva Edison and uh, the city of Brooklyn. It was it was not yet incorporated into the city the, of New York. The borough, right. Yeah. Uh, the borough. As an amusement for your listeners, maybe, um, the city of Brooklyn had trolleys that would run on, uh, on electricity. And these trolleys every once in a while would arc with a huge lightning bolt of electricity that would come out and occasionally hit somebody and kill them. And so when these trolleys would go up and down the, the streets of Flatbush and so on, people would jump out of the way, and that's why we got the name the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, no. So that's that where right? the Brooklyn Dodgers came from. <laughs> they, were dodging, they were dodging the sparks from trolleys. Wow. Um, which is kind of <laughs> – so in any event um, – uh, Very amazing. We, Great story. We have now 7.5 billion people on the planet. Uh, and in the United States, we have an extremely high consumption of carbon, uh, the highest in the world per capita, quite highest, but it's the highest in the world per capita for a developed country like next mm. to Singapore and possibly Qatar. Hmm. Um, amazing. So you have to think, it's amazing, right? So you have to think about this. Every time we burn a gallon of gasoline, one gallon, approximately 20 pounds of carbon dioxide is emitted from the tailpipe. And that That's goes into amazing. the atmosphere. It's pretty odorless, you know, clear, odorless gas, and it absorbs infrared radiation from the sun, which is a little bit is a good thing, 
too much of it too fast, and you start to melt ice caps. And that's exactly what we're doing all around the What's world happening now. now. We're, we're, right, exactly. So I spent uh, seven weeks at sea in the Antarctic last year. Uh, many of my colleagues are going to the Arctic this year. And in the mm-hmm. middle of the summer, uh, the Arctic Ocean this year probably will have the least amount of ice cover in any year. And we've just, just this trajectory has been going on for decades. Uh, so ice is melting all over the world. And uh, That's, uh, this uh, is the first real, uh, real indication that something is amiss. When you have ice that has been stable for hundreds of thousands of years in the Himalayas, of years. In the, hundreds of thousands of years, and all of a sudden, Bhutan will lose virtually all of its its ice. This is Bhutan is next to Nepal. It's one of the tall, highest countries in the world. Um, right. They harvest that water as it melts in the summer to generate electricity for India. Uh, they export electricity, basically. But they don't mm. generate the ice in the winter as they used to. And so they're losing, they're losing that capacity. And many other countries in the world also are losing high altitude losing. ice, not just ice. Right. They're losing. In Peru, right. in, 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 the, in the Andes, okay. It's a big problem. Well, so this, and doctor, this I come, gives to a rise in sea level. Doctor, I just so want to interrupt you for a, a, a quick second and let our listeners know they're listening to the Danny Tisdale Show. And I'm, of course, Danny Tisdale on Harlem World Magazine Radio. And as you know, we're the number one company in the world for all things Harlem, and we are having a what I think is a great conversation, and it's a conversation that is long overdue. Uh, as Dr. Fakowski is talking about it, I'm going to put the numbers out there. Of course, in 150 years, we're losing something we've had for centuries. And um, I'm curious, Doctor, what can we do locally in Harlem to keep climate change at bay if if we can? Well, it's going to be a, a problem several fold. So 125th Street is one of the lowest points in the city, as you know. That's why you have an elevated train uh, that runs right up the Broadway line. Right. So at some point, as sea level rises, there's going to have to be walls that are going to be built along the Hudson and East River, uh, 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 near uh, between probably around 116th Street and 130th Street, where you get oh, bills come again. On, doctor. Are, no. Yes. yes. Walls built? Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're going to have to have some way of keeping, you know, otherwise you're going to have a river the water out. running through the city, right through right through the middle of Harlem. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about major, massive rises in sea level over the next century. Right. We're talking about right. 10 feet approximately, 6 to 10 feet of sea level rise. So in this is going years. to totally change in 100 years. Wow. In 100 years. So this you is know, why I, I, um, I, I think we talk about it. So, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, it used to be. That's I'm, I'm going. So this is that's really where one of the most vulnerable spots in New York City, except for Lower Manhattan. I didn't know well. that. I, I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. And visually, you know, I, I'm just uh, imagining what this looks like in my head, and. Uh, all I can say is, uh, wow, uh, that's uh, incredible and astonishing. Yeah. It is. It's hard to imagine. It is very hard to can imagine. Can we do that anything probably between do. now and that yeah. time so that, that that doesn't happen? Well, obviously, there are many attempts across the world when this is what the Paris Accord was to do, was to reduce right. very dramatically the amount of carbon that is emitted across the planet. Um, and the the culprit, the number one concern uh, all around the world is electricity generation using fossil fuels. So right. we have old power plants, which are hardly used anymore in the United States, it's, it's at least on the eastern seaboard, until you get to Pennsylvania. Uh, they're hardly used. They're, they're backup generators in, uh, for uh, for uh PSENG in New Jersey, there's a few of them that are back up still, I believe, for Con Edison, but mostly Con Edison has switched over to natural gas, which is still a fossil fuel. Right. I, I, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm still uh, stunned by what you were saying uh, uh, seconds ago, and 
you know, would love to kind of continue talking about that. I just want to make sure I, I had that have this clear in my head. You said 125th Street and 135th Street, there would have to be walls built unless something dramatic happens because of the rise of the uh, sea level? You said that was 125th and 135th streets? Oh, Hello, Dr. Fakowski. Dr. Fakowski. Well, folks, I want to apologize. For some reason, we have lost our connection uh, with Dr. Fakowski. And uh, let's see if we can get him back. Uh, okay, on I'm the here. line, Dr. Fakowski. Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry. I'm on a train, so, uh, so I guess I dro- the, the, the phone line just dropped out. I'm on my way to Washington, I, I think D.C. I think the water levels have already started to rise and is interrupting <laughs> our, our conversation here. But I was just yeah. uh, I quickly wanted to just ask you, um, uh, just in case some of the listeners missed this, you were talking, was that the water level affecting 125th Street and 135th Street, those two major no, streets? No, 125th Street, but it, will, it would start, uh, the top of the hill is 116th Street. The bottom of the valley is 125th Street. The top of the hill on the other side is 137th Street. Um, so you have these two hills that have this valley in the middle. Amazing. And that's what will be flooded if uh, we water level gets uh, up another few that's that's amazing and i i i know the clock is ticking and i wanted i have a few more questions for you what advice uh dr Ferkowski, would you give young kids who really want to follow in your uh bio shoes per se um young kids i, I think young kids um uh, should do something experimentally so they should they should be able to Either get a small microscope for uh, the dollar mm. if they can, or or borrow one from school. Um, they should tell a science teacher or a teacher, even in in second and third grade, how interested they are in science. And I wow. think one of the things that that um, and this can be done in a very nice way. So uh, it, I, I know throughout Harlem, Teachers College sends uh, sends students right. teachers Columbia. into the classroom. And uh, if you were to, to try to get student teachers to in, introduce students to scientific experiments that they can do themselves, mm. uh, I think that would be the best way to get a kid interested. They need a little bit of guidance from an adult because right. uh, otherwise they're, they're lost. And mm. the first thing to do is, is to just go on Facebook or YouTube and, and, and just look at, at, at movies. You don't want to just look at movies. Uh, you want to do something with your hands, right? right. You want to be able to dissect uh, or look under the, the microscope at an insect's wing or an insect's eye. Uh, mm. You want to be able to, to, to watch ants as they, as they build their, their nests. You don't just kill the ants. Why don't you take a right. bunch of ants and put them in a, a little box in a sandbox <laughs> and watch them build their nests? Right. And, you know, obviously you have an incredible resource, the Museum of Natural History, just a phenomenal resource. So I would, every kid can, for, you know, a uh, price of the subway fare, get to the Museum of Natural History, and you don't have to go with your class. You can go with your friends uh, and, I, and just I, explore I, it. Well, I was just going it's to tripping. say that that's, those are great ideas. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, and go ahead. Well, I, I think that... The museum is set up, I'm a member, of, I'm on the faculty of the museum as well, but we set the museum, we curate the exhibit to engage children specifically. That's what, what it's curated for. It's not just to be an educational resource. It's there to both be educational and entertaining and drive some curiosity for the kids. I mean, you have, you have incredible people in, in New York City that grew up That's in right. In the city, like Neil deGrasse Tyson is a friend, you know, 
he also, you know, grew up poor and 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 right. And he didn't grow up in Harlem, but he but he went to Bronx. Yeah, I think Science he grew up in New Jersey. He, yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, he's he is. I no, I'm pretty sure he went to Bronx Science. He wasn't. Oh, did he? Okay. When he was a okay. teenager. So, um, but it's it's getting kids to 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 build little clubs or do things together. Mm-hmm. And um, and to 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 have fun doing it. It should be right. fun. Science right. should be fun. Right. It doesn't have to be biology. It doesn't have to be you know. Sci- kids like physics. Kids like uh, you know. Why does the top spin, for example? Uh, why doesn't it right. fall down? Why does a bicycle right. go? Why, why does it fall down when it stops? And, it, and it, if it keeps moving, and you'll stay right. upright on it. Right. So these kinds of things, right. just very simple things that kids you know they experience all the time, but they don't right. sometimes it, don't think about it, right? Right, and and meeting the kids, it sounds like what you're saying, meeting the kids where they are and then trying to get them to get excited about science and the sciences. Exactly, exactly. And, and you can do a lot of science actually in, uh, in, in your kitchen, in a kitchen. You whip up eggs and you can say, why are the eggs, when I whip them up, why do they make a meringue? And it doesn't go mm. back to a liquid. Mm. In fact, it's hard to Asking those questions that way. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and, and especially with uh, with everyday things that kids are doing, and having them ask questions about those everyday activities. Uh, Doctor, we're already at our last few minutes here, I, I, and you know I could continue this conversation because it's great, great stuff, and I haven't asked you all the questions I want to ask you. But if our listeners, which I know they do, and especially their kids uh, and those who are just excited as I am about the work that you're doing can stay in touch with you. You have a website or any kind of uh, URL handles that uh, our listeners can stay in contact with you and see what you're doing and how you're doing it. Sure. Uh, well, we have a couple of websites. We have marine.ruckers.edu. Um, and there, there's a, there you can find all, all kinds of stuff. And then I run the Rutgers Energy Institute. So that's www.rei dot Rutgers dot edu r u t g e r s dot edu r e i Rutgers Energy Institute. And when uh, Doctor, we post this on the website. We will post uh, those uh, uh, URLs and website links that you mentioned. And you know, also what we always like to find out: what is your favorite place in Harlem? Wow. So it used to be, believe it or not, there was a barbecue place on Manhattan Avenue between 123rd and 124th Street, right around the corner from uh, what I don't even know if it's still there. Side, side, side Nim Hospital, right next to it, used to have a um, fire department mm. next to it, and wow. that was a great place for me to visit. But there was this barbecue place where I, you know, <laughs> that was my, I grew up. You know, I'm I'm not a black kid from Harlem, but I loved that that. Uh, barbecue, barbecue place. <laughs> <laughs> so I had collard greens and I had my bits and I I was in hell. Yum. That <laughs> was yum. It was yum. My mother was horrified that I liked it, but I loved it. <laughs> well, you know, you have uh, you have me licking my lips over here because I'm just imagining, you know, a good old fashioned uh, barbecue and collard greens. Uh, that's some good stuff right there. <laughs> it is. It is. Well. And, and, Doctor, I want to thank you again for uh, uh, being on this call and talking to us about the great work that you're doing. And, again, thank you, thank you, and congratulations to uh, winning the um, award with uh, – um, I'm – Sorry, Dr. McCarthy, uh, with Dr. James McCarthy uh, and the 2018 Tyler Prize. Uh, uh, really, thank you for being on the show. And uh, the world thanks you for the great work that you're doing. And thank you. Well, folks, uh, it's been a quick show. And uh, sorry for all the technical difficulties. And um, We'll uh, improve that next time around and uh, really thank the doctor for being on the show. Uh, He's on the run to uh, uh, a gig and really appreciate him taking the time to be out on the show, uh, be on the show. Thank you again, folks, for listening in, and we will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.
Rediscover Cupid, Bacchus, Hermes, Medusa, and other beloved mythological heroes and gods at the Getty Villa, an enchanting recreation of an ancient Roman country house in a quiet canyon overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Discover masterpieces never before on view and explore the Getty Museum's Greek, Roman, and Etruscan treasures. The Getty Villa, located just one mile north of Sunset Boulevard on the Pacific Coast Highway. Reserve your free tickets today at getty.edu slash villa. The mighty blue marlin. You've battled for two solid hours. He jumps again. He's almost at the side of the boat. It's the moment of truth. Because there's never been a better time to test drive the 2018 Mercedes-Benz GLC. With a smooth nine-speed transmission, it loves to run. Set course for your authorized Mercedes-Benz dealer. Visit mbusa.com slash GLC to learn more. Mercedes-Benz, the best or nothing. 